time for election day, Melissa. Yeah, I have a feeling the timing was orchestrated quite well and it wasn't orchestrated by me, so. <laughs> but it is how it all worked out, so we'll take it. Julia, thank you for your cookies. Oh, you're welcome. I like them so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on my shoulder. Ah, no, no. Are, are you making oh. cookies for people, Julia? <laughs> I, I was gonna say it too, Hello. Tracy. Thank I you. Don't want to make cookies. I'm not I didn't want to. That eat was paused. <laughs> <Paul. laughs> Hi, Corliss. Hello. Here I am. I can't find my Bible though. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, congratulations, Melissa. Thanks, James. <laughs> congratulations, Melissa. Thank you, Donna. Congratulations, <laughs> Melissa. Thank you. Theo's message. All right, everybody, we are starting our time of worship together. We are so glad that you are here with us uh, to worship God together, to come into his presence with the community of saints online and to come before his word. And uh, we're going to have Jason lead us into a time of worship together.
Good morning, church. Every Sunday, we begin our service by hearing from God's word. As a reminder that God is alive, present, and wants us to hear from him. Join me as we hear God speak to us from Psalm 113, 1 through 9. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts, his, lifts the needy from the ash heap. To make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall, we'll join the and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of Well, good morning, everyone. Once again, I am so glad to get to be back with you. Uh, for those of you that were in last week's service or joined us online or watched it on YouTube, you know that I wasn't able to be with you last week as I was traveling, but it is very good to be back with my church family. And uh, I want to say a special thank you uh, for those of you that were praying for me during my trip and uh, 
I know that uh, those prayers uh, mattered a great deal to me and to my family. So thank you for those prayers and that encouragement uh, that many of you have given to me. I also want to thank everybody that uh, came out to help the other night on Friday night as we did our movie night out at the Blue Oak Apartments here in River Oaks. And uh, I want you to know that uh, we were invited back to do it again by the apartment complex. So we're going to be working on details for that. So uh, that's an encouraging uh, thing. And we're looking forward to having more of us involved in just connecting with the people in this community and sharing with them. We do have a few announcements that we want to share this morning as we continue to be the kind of church that God has called us to be, to glorify him as worshipers, proclaimers, disciplers, servants, and stewards. Well, one of the ways that we do that is through our regular discipleship, right? So tonight at 5 p.m., we have our men's forge group at the Grazia Day home. And uh, gentlemen, if you are coming tonight, uh, I think Jason, I know Jason sent you an email this week, uh, but I have yet to hear from many of you. So if you want dinner provided by the church in the form of a Chipotle burrito, you need to send me your Chipotle order uh, early this afternoon. Wait till after church is over, but make sure you do that uh, so that we can get you uh, your favorite burrito and uh, we'll be happy to do that. Ladies groups are online tonight, uh, both separate women's groups going to be doing your book study and that'll start at 6 p.m. for the women unless one of the ladies flags me and says that's not right. So I'm looking at the screen. They're all saying that's that looks right. Next Sunday morning, God willing, we will be live in person back at the ravine for uh, in-person worship. Uh, we're hoping to do that on November 8th and 22nd. Uh, we'll get you some more details uh, with confirmations this week, but uh, right now we are good to go for that, and we're excited about the opportunities to go back there and join in worship. It's going to feel, uh, you know, maybe a little bit different than our, our last time since we did our time change uh, today, and uh, that means all of you, by the way, are going to stay awake right during throughout the sermon because you all got an extra hour of sleep last night, and uh, all of you are here nice and early for church, I'm sure, right? Uh, but uh, next Sunday, uh, 1030 at the Ravine, uh, we'll also be celebrating communion together. So you're going to want to be there and we'll get you more details about that this week. The next Sunday night, we continue in our special mixed gospel and life groups. And uh, once again, we have the privilege of having some of our global partners joining us. Uh, this is Mitch and Sarah and their beautiful little baby girls. And uh, they're going to be joining us next Sunday night. Uh, Mitch and Sarah are actually in California right now, um, awaiting a return to their field. So we're going to be having them join us from the Southern California area. And we're excited about this because just uh, as many of you know, at the end of this month, we get to begin our Lottie Moon Christmas offering emphasis, our offering for international missions. 100% of what we give goes overseas. We are hoping to set our largest goal ever and meet it um, by God's grace. Over the last few years, we've been empowered to do that. Um, and so we want to, to uh, continue to support in prayer. So you're going to want to be there next Sunday night online uh, as we do our small mixed small group and get to meet with Mitch and Sarah. And then on November 15th, 6 p.m., we'll have our uh, men's forge and women's group crossover. November 22nd, 6 p.m., we'll be back having our mixed gospel and life groups with some evangelism training. So uh, we have a lot of of good things planned for the month of November to help us grow up into the image of our Savior, Jesus. We also want to remind you that uh, throughout this month, we are continuing to receive funds for our Global Hunger Relief Offering. And uh, some of you uh, who've contributed in the past may have gotten a uh, magazine in the last week or so from Send Relief. Uh, some of you have contributed to Send Relief at Christmas time. Maybe you've bought some goats for some needy families, or you've uh, taken on one of the food relief projects around the world. You probably noticed that the logo is a little bit different than it has been in prior relief uh, years because we are uniting our relief organizations within our Great Commission Baptist family and we're uniting them all together under uh, the organization called Send Relief now. 
uh, what had once been Baptist global response and uh, world hunger relief and uh, the North American Mission Board uh, relief organizations, all under one organization now. So if you see that Send Relief uh, magazine come, uh, that's what that is. And we can get you a copy of that if you would like to uh, participate in that as well. So we want to thank all of you who are supporting that offering and who've been so generous in doing that. So those are some of our announcements. Let's continue to proceed into a time of intercession. You know, uh, I have been reminded over the last few weeks of the importance and the power of prayer, how desperately we need to come into the presence of the living God. Um, you know, one of the great illusions that Satan spins up for all of us is that we don't really need God. We need to be busy. We need to be doing a lot of different things. But what we don't need to do is spend time in God's presence and nothing could be further from the truth. And that's true not only for us as individuals, but as a church family. So we want to uh, be in prayer for one another. We want to be in prayer for the work that God is doing in and through our church. And this week in particular, I want to be praying um, for our church members who are entering new places of employment. If you don't know, uh, if you look at some of the faces on the screen, there are new roles and new places of employment for a large number of our church members in proportion to our body. And uh, one of the things that we want to be praying for is that as God sends them into new roles and new places of working, that they will be empowered in those mission fields to share the good news, right? When God puts us in a new place of work, it's not just for uh, new financial benefits or a new uh, opportunity to use our gifts that God has given us, but these are mission fields that God gives us. These are our roles that we get to steward so that the world can see Jesus. So we're going to pray for those church members who are in new jobs or entering new jobs uh, this week. Uh, it, this week alone, Monday, we have somebody starting a new job. Tuesday, we have somebody starting a new job in a new, uh, uh, Monday's new job, new place. Tuesday, a uh, new job, uh, same place. But, uh, and then last week, we had some people starting new jobs. So there's a lot uh, going on in that realm. So we want to be praying for that. And then we also want to be praying that God takes the, uh, the opportunities we, the rest of us have in the midst of our ordinary, keeping on doing the same things, uh, that, that in the midst of all those things, that God will give us opportunities to share the gospel, to proclaim good news, and to live out of that good news in such a way that the world is drawn to our living Savior, Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, we want to pray this morning because we know that some of you are really hurting. Some of you are hurting physically. Some of the people who aren't with us on this Zoom interaction uh, this morning are not feeling well. Uh, we want to be in prayer for physical healing. And then I know that some of you are hurting emotionally. Some of you are really struggling. This has been a really hard year. And I know that. I know that um, that each of us has had different types of, of challenges and uh, problems come up and we face loneliness and frustration with uh, disconnection from our community uh, during this time of COVID. By God's grace, we, we continue months and months into this to have not experienced firsthand within our church um, the, the effects of the COVID illness, and we want to be thankful to God for that. But we recognize that there is emotional pain and that there is, um, there are hurting uh, people in our faith community. So we want to pray for one another. And so um, if you're one of those people that's hurting, maybe you're watching this um, on Facebook or on YouTube, we want you to know that we're praying for you as well, that God would be a God of comfort and peace, and that he would remind you of the greatness and vastness of his love for you, that he has redeemed you and bought you and chosen you and called you and set you aside for his purpose. And you are precious in his sight and you are loved more than you can possibly imagine. And so we want to encourage you to remember that this morning. So let's pray together as a church family. Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging that we have no right to come before you as your children. We were alienated, hostile. We were your enemies. And yet you came to us, you disarmed us, you took down our emotional and spiritual shields. 
And rather than cutting us down with your wrath, you chose instead to pour forth your love. You gave us your grace. You embraced us. And then you told us that you were going to wash us clean and cover us with a robe of righteousness of your son. And then you were going to grant us the same authority and title as one of your own children and bring us into your presence now and forever. And because of that good news, we are encouraged to come to you boldly in our time of need to receive mercy and grace. So everything we ask for today, we know is a grace, a mercy from you. So Lord, first and foremost, we are so thankful for the provision of earthly work, places of employment, that are places to steward our gifts, our time, our energy, our talents. We confess that sometimes maybe we spend too much time in those places, trying to find our own significance and our own satisfaction. And yet, Lord, we're asking that for those who are entering new places of, of ministry, that they would see that, that they would be empowered to see the people around them, to love, to share the gospel with, to serve in your name, to be salt and light. As they enter new roles, that they would be empowered to fulfill those roles in such a way that people are not drawn to them, but drawn beyond them to uh, you, to our Savior so the world can see and know and delight in you. So give them boldness and courage and passion and wisdom and grace. For those of us who are keeping on, keeping on, uh, trying to stay the steady course in the tasks that you have set before us day in and day out, whether that's in our home, whether it's caring for elderly siblings or spouses or sick uh, friends, um, in all the midst of, of just the ordinariness of life, going to ordinary places of work. We want to be the saints that you have called us to be. We want to be a people who are holy and set aside for you, living out of your presence for your glory, examining ourselves and being humble and repentant where we need to be and being changed and transformed by the circumstances you providentially ordained. We want to be faithful. So make us bold. Give us opportunities we don't deserve. And give us a joy and a delight in sharing and living out the good news. And we pray for those who are hurting today. Some in our body who are ill. We pray for physical healing. From joints to lungs to uh, physical weariness to all kinds of other physical symptoms, Lord. We're praying for your healing touch. We're asking God that you would use as appropriate physicians and other medical caregivers, but we trust for you to be our healer. We pray for that healing to extend beyond our bodies into our very souls and minds, our emotions. We need your healing grace and your strength. We need you to reach down and renew, refresh, comfort, and redirect. We pray for purpose and joy for all in our body. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ 
alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless being this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body laid light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost his grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand see till he returns until he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand good morning everybody i got some feedback last week in our ladies group that i was hard to hear because we sit so far back are we all good can we all hear me no is this better is it better Okay. Oh, I'm still getting, okay. I'm just going to be really close up on my face now. All right. We're going to do it like this. Um, every week at Redeemer, we get a chance as a congregation to come together in a time of prayer focused on confession and illumination. In this time, we confess our own sins, ask God to convict us, and ask God the Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds during the preaching of his word. I will leave this time of prayer this morning, and I invite all of you to pray yourselves for conviction, forgiveness, and illumination quietly as I pray out loud. Father God, this morning we come before you to confess our own sins, as well as the sins of the body. We confess that in our own minds we slander others, blaspheme against you, that we are angry and unkind. We confess that we do not glorify you with our thoughts, words, and deeds, that we do not believe your word, that we do not come to you with respect and gratitude. We confess that we are idolaters, adulterers, thieves, and revilers. And we confess that we are each one of us unrighteous and that we do not recognize the darkness in our own hearts without your work in us. God, we recognize that we are unable to atone for these sins on our own, and we know that we'll never be able to change through our own works. So Father God, we thank you this morning that your grace is sufficient to cover each of our sins and the sins that we commit corporately. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross and the continued indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. We know that we have no right on our own to even ask you for your conviction and your illumination. However, we know that your word assures us that you know our hearts and our minds. We are assured of your correction and your forgiveness upon repentance, and we ask that you continue to lead us to come to you in response to our own sin. Knowing that we can approach you, certain of your grace and forgiveness, we come before you this morning. We ask that you convict us, calling us to repentance, 
and changing our hearts to reflect your glory. We ask for you to illumine our hearts as we listen to your word preached. And we ask that your word will cut each of us deeply, removing our doubting, our idolatry, our rebellion, and our reluctance to obey you. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon us and challenge and comfort us. We ask for you to cause Pastor Chris to be bold, to be clear and effective, to be gentle, loving, and protective of your people. We ask that we will all be open to your word, that we will all be changed, and that people will be saved by your word being preached. We pray, thank you, and make all of these petitions in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Alrighty. That was way too close. Now that I can see it, I'm sorry, guys. We're just going to, I'm just going to talk a little louder. Um, okay, so we're going to move into our children's gospel time now. I'm really excited about this one. This will be a fun week. I'm looking forward to it. So, Bella, I want to apologize, and you too, Jonah, that I didn't do this last week. We didn't want to stress Pastor Varnum out and have too much going on, but you know what? I'm excited to be back. So, can I see everybody? Where is she? I can see Jonah and am I crazy? Okay, now I can see Bella. All right, you guys can't be on my screen at the same time. I'm gonna be sad. Yeah. All right, there. Oh, I got you. Okay. I got it. I'm sorry, guys. I'm a I'm a mess this morning. Alrighty, so we're gonna start off pretty simple here, Bella. Jonah, you guys gonna help me out? Whenever we read the Bible, we ask ourselves how many questions. Who's calling? How many questions? I know. How many questions do we ask? Please. What'd you say? Please. Good job. Yeah. Jonah, where'd you go? Get back here. We're doing a lesson. Right. So our first question is, what did I learn about God today? Right? Okay. Jesus. The second one's about Jesus. Yes, Bella. You've got to give Jonah a chance to answer, though. My goodness. He's never going to talk if you don't give him a time. All righty. He's never going to talk. Third question, Bella. Because they're mute. <laughs> he is muted. You're right. He's not going to talk to us because he's muted. All right. Our third question is what do I do with what I learned today? All righty. So we're going to talk about God first, right? So we already know that God loves us. We talked about it a lot, right? And we've also talked about the fact that God has a plan for a perfect, unbroken world that he created. And in that perfect world, God gave us each as people different jobs and things to do from each other. And that's a good thing. We should all be doing different things because that's what he created. <laughs> but then the people were bad, right? Thumbs down. Humans are bad. Adam and Eve did not do the right thing. And look at what happened to the world, right? We got that broken world now. And sometimes we think that God gave us those different jobs because the world is broken, but that's not true. We had those jobs way before that happened. Adam and Eve had different things to do in the garden. And now we still have different things to do with a broken world, but now we don't like it. We don't want to do what yes, God Yes, I can because you yeah, can see this part of my head. Yeah, you're, I can only see the top of her head. Gosh. All righty. So here's a way we can look and see <laughs> the order God created us to do things in, right? So first, <laughs> God sent Jesus. And Jesus is perfect, right? He's always thumbs up. Can you do a thumbs up with me? Jonah, can you do a thumbs up with me, bud? I know you know this one. All righty. Good job. Okay. So he created, um, he sent Jesus to show us how to be thumbs up because Jesus always obeyed God, right? That wasn't because he's less than God. It's because that's the order. That's what he was sent to do. He was sent to follow God and obey him in this world. And then God made men and he made women and he made women second. And this one's hard for some people, but that means that in the church, women follow men. And then there's little Anne. And I know you know who Anne is, our little purple girl, because that's supposed to represent Bella and Jonah, right? So that's a little kid. And little kids, they listen to grownups. Do you have to listen to the grownups in your life, Bella? Uh -oh. Yes, you do. <laughs> don't, don't say that. I know you know the truth. All right, so we can see that God created us to do these things in an order. He gave us a type of person to follow and a type of person to help, okay? You just can't see my head. You can just see my head. 
All right, Bella, who's our second question about? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. So we know that God sent Jesus, right? And then what did Jesus show us? He showed us that he was obedient to God in all things when he was here. And this is super important. The order that God created did not just happen when Jesus was here on earth. No, that was like 2,000 years ago. 2,000. Do you even know that number, Bella? That's a hard number. Wow. But today, we still have the order. We still have people. Okay? So it's really important to remember. And then our last question. What do I do with what I learned today? Right? We talked a little bit about that. You can see that there's God. Jesus and Jesus showed men and women what to do and men and women are supposed to help kids right so Bella Jonah you should be listening to your parents and Bella you should be listening to grandma and Nana and Jonah you should be listening to grandma Mary because guess what those are the people God put in your life and their job is to help you learn what to do so when you listen to them this week and you obey them and you do what they tell you to do you are actually helping them do their job at the same time that you're doing your job. Doesn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually when grandma and Nana or when mom and dad tell you what to do, the best thing you can do is be like, thank you. That's awesome because you're helping me to learn what my job is. All right. Do you guys have any questions about anything we learned this week? Bella, you have a question? No. Okay, just moving by. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I'll see you guys next week. Bye, Jonah. Bye, Bella. Bye. Well, thank you, Rachel. And thanks for giving us that preview. We are in our series that we have entitled Ordinary Saints. And we are about to see exactly how ordinary these Corinthian Christians were. And we want to be reminded that the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to remind them that if they have encountered the good news of Jesus Christ, that they are no longer just ordinary people, but they are ordinary people who are being changed into the image of their Savior, Jesus Christ, just like Rachel was talking about to Bella and Jonah. And in particular, we're going to see, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 today, that, that there's a problem that the Corinthians had with worship services. They, they, they were kind of like us, and their problems weren't just tech problems like we have sometimes. No, they had the problems that churches still have 2,000 years later. The problems that they had had to do with their Lord's Supper and uh, how they were treating one another in church and what they were doing with their spiritual gifts in church. And they had some challenges too about the roles of men and women in the church. And so today we see how the Apostle Paul begins to unpack all of this teaching that he wants them to have in light of the gospel and to say, listen, you're not just ordinary anymore. You are the people of God saved by the blood of Jesus, brought into right relationship with God. And that needs to change how you act within the church and how you treat one another within the church. So let's read together from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16. Now, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is, a, since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, 
but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. This is God's holy and inerrant word. May he add his blessing to its reading and proclamation. Now, I know that the passage I just read probably led many of you to be immediately uncomfortable. There's all kinds of things we don't really understand well without diving into this passage. There's things that seem antiquated, out of touch, out of place with our reality. Does Paul really mean that for women throughout the ages in all places and in all cultures that they ought to have their heads covered? Now, ladies, this is not an attack, but I'm looking around on my screen here and I see none of you with your head covered except Melissa just pulled up her uh, sweater, I think, to try and make a point. Maggie's got a, a notebook on her head. Uh, so I appreciate the, the feedback there. Is that what Paul meant? for our different uh, people to express themselves with down through the ages. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you found this confusing, you are in very good company. I spent much of the week studying this text and burying myself in some of the best scholars. I believe I read five of the best scholars' commentaries on this, including one who was doing research all the way back to the second century and into commentaries on this particular passage. And there are some real challenges here in understanding how do we apply the key principles that the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us about the nature of worship, the nature of men and women's relationship within the church, and the, how does it tie in to the good news of Jesus Christ? One thing I can tell you before we dive into it is this. When you approach a passage like this, and if you approach it with a legalistic frame of mind, and your only question is asking whether or not you ought to still have to wear a particular type of head covering in worship, you have already missed the point. You've already missed the point of the passage. And so one thing for us to remember is that Paul is trying to teach universal principles down throughout the ages for the church, and he's illustrating the reality and permanence of those principles in ways that are expressed differently in different cultures and times. And if we will hold firmly to that principle, we'll do well as we study. The second thing I want to say before I outline today's passage is this. At the end of the passage, Paul issues a strong warning to believers in Corinth who would like to be contentious, who want to debate. They want to argue not simply the application that Paul is making, but the principles itself. And you know what? There are a lot of people today who would like to excise the passage I just read right out of our Bibles. In fact, without any evidence whatsoever, there's a number of so-called biblical scholars who would really just literally like to not have this in your Bible at all because they don't want it to be there. They don't want it to be something that the church has to wrestle with and struggle through. And while we may not do something that Thomas Jefferson did, which is to take a physical pair of scissors and cut passages out of the Bible that we don't like, we can do that just by refusing to read them or study them or meditate on them. 
or to ask ourselves hard questions when things don't seem very clear. So let me encourage you, don't be contentious. Submit yourself to the word of God, and even now, ask the Holy Spirit to be illuminating your mind and your heart to give you understanding not only of the key principles, but how you and I are called to apply these principles in our lives in contemporary worship in 2020. So as we look at today's passage, I want you to see three key principles, three key truths that will help us understand what Paul is trying to drive towards in worship. And the first is that we have an authoritative gospel. This is not something new. Paul has brought this up before. I've used it before uh, as a key point of the passage. We have an authoritative gospel. Then secondly, we're going to see that we not only have an authoritative gospel, we have a gendered gospel. We have a gendered gospel. Now hang tight till I get there for you to make sure you really understand what I'm saying. And then we're going to see how we have a renewing gospel. So an authoritative gospel, a gendered gospel, and a renewing gospel. Well, what do we mean when we say that we have an authoritative gospel? Well, Paul is trying to say to the Corinthian Christians, yes, you have been saved. Yes, you have been bought by the blood of Jesus. Yes, that has set you free from the power of sin and Satan and death. But guess what? You're not completely free. When you come to Jesus, you come under his authority, and his authority is mediated. It's transferred to structures within this world that he has set up to cause there to be order. And order is very important to the Apostle Paul. We're going to see how he wants there to be order in the church as we study 1 Corinthians 14. But here in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, I want you to understand. Now, if Paul says, here's the thing, I want you to understand something, that's probably a good place to pay attention, right? I want you to understand that the head of of every man is Christ. Now, if you stop looking at the rest of the verse, I think most people would kind of nod their head. Yes, we're, we're all in the church. We're under the authority of Jesus. He's the head. We're the body. We're under his authority. And then he goes on to say, the head of a wife is her husband. And immediately we kind of begin to flinch a little reflexively. We've seen abuse of women by men. We've seen men manipulate their authority. And so we kind of reflex against that. And we go, oh, I don't know if I like that. But in the same way that the head of every man is Christ, we see that the head of a wife is her husband. And then he goes on to say, in fact, we have a great model, an example in front of us that we see that the head of Christ is God, that Jesus, as the Son of God, willingly, joyfully, and fully chose to submit himself to the authority of the Father. And Paul is trying to teach us something important within the church. He says, listen, we're all under authority. This is, in fact, part of God's creation and established plan, that God's created and established earthly authorities who have various fears of authority. So we have governmental authorities that we as Christians are to submit to. We have authorities in our workplaces, bosses and employers that we're to submit to. And within the church, there are authorities. And within the family, there are authorities. In fact, scripture says there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, the verse that the passage that's right above it is let every person be subject to the governing authorities. When you and I encounter people who are our head in different, different spheres of life, we are to joyfully submit ourselves to them. That means that rejection of both God's direct authority, that's the authority he expresses directly to us through his word, through his presence, and it's what we would, we would have if we were to step into the presence of God the Father or Jesus personally, we would say, yes, we're under their authority, but also his mediated authority, the authority that God has given to governments, to, to leaders in church, to family life, 
Uh, he says, if you reject that authority, it's sin. It's sin. In fact, we can even point out that this is what happened in the garden, that Adam and Eve rejected the authority of God. And as a result, they became alienated from God and furthered themselves in their rejection of God's authority. They became hostile to God's authority. They were alienated and hostile of mind, and that resulted in them doing evil deeds. Very often we want to say, no, I sin, but I don't mean to. And we don't see ourselves as doing it out of a rejection of a relationship with God and out of the fact that we don't really want God telling us what to do. Now, here's some good news. The essential work of Jesus Christ was to reconcile rebellious sinners to God, to take those people who didn't want to be under his authority and bring them back under his authority. So we find passages like Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where it says, Jesus, or God the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness. We're no longer under the authority of a spirit of rebellion, under Satan's authority, under death's authority, but we've been transferred to a new kingdom, the kingdom of his beloved son. That means when you came to a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you've believed in him, you have been set free from your old authority. You're no longer under the authority of your passions, your flesh, your own selfishness. You're not under that authority, but it doesn't mean you don't have any authority. It means you have the authority of your new king, the kingdom of Jesus. And that's the only way that we can get true redemption and forgiveness of sins. You can't get the redemption without coming into the authority of the king. Many of us wrongly live as if we can partake of Christ's salvation, but reject his lordship or his authority in our lives. It's saying, Jesus, I want the benefits of a relationship with you, but I don't want you telling me what to do. And I really don't want to be under the authority of somebody else that you've assigned to be an authority over me. Well, let me just remind you of some things that Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Can I just pause you right there? In an election season, there are people out there who are running for public office who will take on the name of Jesus in order to get your vote. Not everyone who says to Jesus, Lord, Lord, will actually enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Don't be fooled by outsiders who say, I'm a follower of Jesus, but their lives bear no fruit of the gospel. They do not overflow with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And when you look in the mirror, don't be fooled if you say, yes, yes, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. I believe in him, but you bear no fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you came to Jesus and he saved you, you came under his authority. Or as Jesus put it elsewhere, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Well, we can see how critical it is for us to come under the authority of Christ. And that means that in all these spheres that the gospel we are saved by comes to us with authority. So in the home, wives are called to submit particularly to the authority of their husbands. And I've said this before, ladies, it's not submission if you agree with him. You don't submit until you disagree. The word means yield. So when scripture says things like this, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It means you yield when you disagree. For the husband is the head of the wife. And there's that same word, kafale, which is from the Greek. It does not mean, as some scholars would like to argue, source. It is clearly about the word authority here. The word submission is in opposition to it. 
So it means if Christ is your head, you submit to him there. So for the husband is the head of the wife, even as the Christ, as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Wow, that's a big, heavy statement about mediated authority. Jesus says when you come into the gospel, you come under a mediated authority in this world. Now, that authority is always dependent upon submission to God. So, Women, if your husband is telling you to walk away from Jesus, to not obey him, to not read God's word, to not be with God's people, that is a command of your husband. You are completely free to disobey. But outside of the realm of direct scriptural commands, you don't have that freedom when you take upon yourself the marital vows. Now, it's not just for wives, right? In the home, children are called to obey and honor their parents. Scripture is clear. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is, this is the promise of God that they will be blessed if you will honor and obey our parents. So we see how in the home, there's mediated authority. At work, we submit to our employers. So we see passages like this in Scripture. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, just like you would if Jesus was your boss. So treat your bosses like you would treat Jesus. Do what they ask you to do within the place of employment. As long as it's not an ethical or moral violation, a violation of your scriptural commands, do what your boss tells you to do. Because that's why they've been given there, to, to serve as an overseer of your gifts and your talents. And in the church, we mutually submit to the authority of the church body. Everyone in the church is under the church's authority. So in Ephesians 5.21, we find passages like this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, which is an application of the principle of mutual submission and yielding. We recognize that when the body of the Christ has gathered together, for example, in church discipline, we're to submit to the church's authority. When a church congregationally makes decisions, and it may not be our favorite decision that we would not have made, maybe we voted against it, but we submit joyfully and cheerfully to that process, knowing that God has mediated his authority to the body. And in the church, we go further. We submit particularly to the authority of our elders, our pastors, the ones that God has set aside. So scripture says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Now, you've heard me preach about this before, but let me make this very clear. Someday, I will not only have to account for my own sins, but I will actually be called to account for the sins of the people on the screen in front of me. Does that seem heavy? It sure feels heavy to me sometimes. So when we are given spiritual leaders, recognize that they are there for our protection, that they are given this to follow and submit to. And in the church, women are called to a subordinate role of submitting to the authority of male leadership. And this is where the apostle is struggling with the Corinthians in worship. So he's going to say in 1 Corinthians 14 and then writing to Timothy passages like this. Let a warm woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, some of you are very good scholars, and you will have pointed out, uh, already figured out that in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul has already said, wait a second. He's talking about women prophesying and praying in church. So which is it? Well, good news we're not going to deal with that today. We're going to pick it up in 1 Corinthians 14 whenever Paul addresses this more directly there. 
So there is a role and a place for women to lead in church, and we certainly endorse that here at Redeemer, where we do put women in roles of praying and speaking truth into body life. But we also want to recognize that there is a way in which women are to follow male leadership within the church that reflects the authority of Christ. So let me give us a couple of principles that are so key here. Every one of us, men and women, we are called to steward mediated authority. Maybe you're a mom. Maybe you're a, a, a church council member. Maybe you're a uh, boss at work. Maybe you've got employees that work for you. All of us in different spheres of life, we are called to steward mediated authority. You know, and when I say mediated authority, I mean authority given by Jesus to you in different spheres of life. Jesus was speaking to Pontius Pilate, and he said to him, Pilate, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. We recognize that Jesus places people in positions and roles of authority to carry out his work in this world. And because of that, we steward that mediated authority to sacrificially serve others. And that's in the church and outside the church. So our authority is not to get our way. In fact, one way you can know a leader is a bad leader is whether or not they use their authority to benefit themselves or to benefit all of the people they are called to serve. And that's a good lesson for our politicians as well. Jesus said, in this world, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. The way we enact and use power in the church is supposed to be different from the way the pagan world uses it. And so he says, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In the same way that Jesus laid down his life for us, we are called in our places of leadership and authority in the home, in the church, in our workplaces, we are called to steward that mediated authority to serve other people and to glorify God, to bring God glory in everything, just like Pastor Barton was preaching to you last week. And we want to be reminded that we are all under the head of the body, and that is Jesus. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, not us. And he wants to be magnified or made supreme or made preeminent in everything. When we steward mediated authority within our homes, husbands, if you're using authority within your home, you're doing it to serve your wife and your children, and you're doing it in such a way that Jesus gets the glory. Spiritual leaders, if you're doing it within the church, over your small group, or on the church council, or as an elder in the church, you're doing this to serve the body, and you're doing it in such a way that God gets the glory. Parents, when you're using authority, it's not to tell your kids to knock it off. You're using your authority to serve them sacrificially, laying down your life for them so that God is magnified and the world sees a different way of using the authority that God gives us. So we want to recognize that we have an authoritative gospel. This is key to understanding the rest of what the apostles are going to teach here in 1 Corinthians 11. The second key principle is that we have a gendered gospel, a gendered gospel. And here's what I mean by it. Take a look at verses 4 and 5, absolutely key to understanding this passage, right? Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Now, I want to ask you to do something that's really hard. Don't ask any questions about the head coverings for a second. Recognize this, that Paul is teaching a universal principle that says the way men and women worship the Savior who saved them is different. 
It's gendered. There are different expressions of it. And that's absolutely key to what he's trying to explain within the church. Now, let me be clear. Women and men are saved in the same way by the same work of Jesus, okay? It's not one way to get saved if you are a man and a different way to get saved if you are a woman. No, all of us are saved by grace through faith. That is not of our own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. None of us got saved because we were a man or a woman. None of us got saved because we did or did not do a particular thing. We got saved because God chose to set his electing love upon us and give us a free gift that was not the result of our own goodness or moral works, but because he chose to lovingly select us and redeem us and make us his own freely. And we partake of that salvation through faith and repentance. When we place our faith in him, trusting in that work of Jesus, repenting of our sins, submitting to his lordship, we experience the salvation of God. And that is true for men and women. But, and this is so important, just because you got saved, the gospel did not make you into some gendered, neutered person. Your masculinity and your femininity were not removed from you in the moment of your salvation. You weren't saved differently, but you are different though you are saved. So we see that scripture wants to teach us that our gender is a God-assigned gift. It is not, as you are being told constantly in contemporary media, a mere human social construct or an individual choice. Women, you cannot choose to be men, and men, you cannot choose to be women. It is not a choice that is yours to make unless you are willing to rebel against your creator and say to him, you got it wrong. I wish I had been made a woman, or I wish I had been made a man, is to say, God, you made a mistake. But the creator who knit you together in the womb has not made a mistake. He has assigned you a physical gender. So scripture says things like this, Jesus himself saying, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And by the way, no, there are not 60 or 70 types of gender or sexual preference. There are two. Jesus has assigned them, male and female. I understand that many people feel trapped by that. They feel confined by it. They feel like they're not what they see as a picture of masculinity or femininity, or they feel like their, their sexual attraction doesn't match their own gender typing. And I understand that those feelings seem dominant and real. But we need to pause and humble ourselves before the word of God and say, all of us were made male or female. The creator has made this assignment, not us. And here's some good news. Both men and women are made in the image of the living God, but we uniquely reflect his glory through our gender differences, not by becoming like each other, but by becoming fully who he created us to be. Adam does not most glorify God by trying to get in touch with his inner Eve. And Eve does not most glorify God by trying to express herself as Adam. Rather, by fulfilling all that they have been created to be, they bring God glory. So scripture is very clear about this. Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And that means 
that we need to understand that there is a creation order and that creation order has consequences for the family and for the church. That means that when God chose to create Adam first, he didn't make a mistake. And when he assigned Adam the responsibility of naming the animals and, and having dominion over the garden and tending it and tilling it, and only secondarily gave him Eve, it means that he put the greater burden of responsibility on Adam. Now, you may ask, why? Why did he do that? Women are smarter, more communicative. They're better at many tasks than men. And I would amen everything you say. I live with four women and I have a dog that's a woman. And I understand the superiority of women in countless ways. I fully acknowledge that. But here's what I want you to understand. God didn't make a mistake. When he made Adam first, he intended there to be a priority order of responsibility and authority. And that communicates in the church. And so you see Paul making this theological point. He says, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. He says, don't miss the creation order. It wasn't an accident. And that creation order consigns each of us to realms of responsibility and ways that we can glorify God. Because that creation order reveals a creation purpose, a creation person, purpose. For, uh, verse 9, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That means, ladies, that you recognize as a true daughter of Eve that you are the result of God looking at his creation and for the first time saying, it is not good. Here's the thing. Even in the garden, before there was sin, Adam didn't have completion until Eve showed up. So God says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an Ezer Konegdo, a helper fit for him. I will complete humanity by creating a like opposite who will be like him and yet who will be the fulfillment of him to be a full expression of all that I am. And that means men and women most glorify God when they fulfill the purposes and roles that God has given them, when they are satisfied with the reality of who God has created them to be. Now, that's the theology of the passage that comes to some specific applications to the Corinthian church that we can have some applications of. Apparently, in the Corinthian church, women were saying, now that I'm saved and now that I have the spirit living within me, I don't need to listen to the male leaders within the church. I have the same Holy Spirit they do, and when I'm in church praying and prophesying, I want to act like a man. And in that situation, in that community, one of the ways you expressed your masculinity and femininity was how you covered yourself during worship. And women were rejecting that role, choosing androgyny. And what, what do you mind mean by androgyny? being deliberately and intentionally like the opposite gender or trying to be gender neutral. And Paul's got a huge problem with this. He says, in the church, we're not gender neutral. In fact, if you're doing that, you might even be trying to usurp a God-assigned roles, a, a, a God-assigned role. And if you are doing that, it is an expression of the fall, not of creation. So we need to grasp that every time in Christian worship and in Christian life, when we choose androgyny, becoming like the opposite gender or becoming gender neutral, or if we choose to usurp the God-given roles that he has given us, it's not because God created us that way, but because we are fallen. Go to Genesis 3.16, and you'll see 
that put into tension as part of the curse on humanity. God spoke to Eve and he said, Eve, I'm going to multiply your pain in childbearing and in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule or dominate over you. He says the relationship between man and woman is broken. Adam and Eve were staring at each other, trying to figure out while they had been naked and unashamed, and Eve was fully all that it meant to be a woman, and Adam was fully all that it meant to be to be a man. Now Eve was going to seek to, according to the, the a better translation perhaps of the Greek, uh, the Hebrew there, she would grasp at the man. She would want to seek his role. She wanted to fulfill his purpose. She wanted to be like him, but instead the man would push her back and try and dominate her rather than serving her with his authority. He was now going to try and use her and misuse her and abuse her. Well, that has continued down throughout the ages. So we need to reject that. In Christian worship and life, chosen androgyny or usurping God-assigned roles is a form of rebellion against our creator. It's saying, God, you didn't get it right, and I refuse to accept it. You find passages in the Old Testament that seem harsh to us, but they are an expression of this critical principle. When God told the Old Testament people of Israel that they were not to be like their tribes, the, the tribes of the people around them, the pagans, and he says, men, you are not to put on women's clothes, and women, you are not to put on man's clothes. And yes, I understand that's culturally different in every society. For example, I'm not wearing a robe this morning that would be appropriate for an ancient Israelite man, right? The point isn't the clothing itself. The point is stop trying to be like each other because it's an abomination to the Lord your God. It's a rejection of who he has made you to be. And so in Christian worship and life, when we do this, we dishonor ourselves. We dishonor ourselves. And that's what Paul is trying to get to. He says, women, I want you to understand something. And men, I want you to understand something. Men, if you're in worship and you are praying or prophesying in a way that is normative for women in this society, you are dishonoring the authority of God his headship over you. You're actually saying to God, no, God, you got it wrong. I'm going to act like a woman in church. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered is dishonoring the creator and his authority and saying, no, God, I'm not going to be the woman you made me into. I'm going to be like a man. He goes on to say, it's as dishonoring to God as if your head were shaven. Because in this society, for a woman to shave her head was a sign of a great insult. It's what they did to prostitutes and adulterers when they caught them. So when he says, if you're going to have your head uncovered, you might as well go ahead and shave your head and cut it short. It's disgraceful for a woman to do this. Cover your head, women. He's saying embrace your God-given identity in worship. Yes, pray. Yes, prophesy. But do it as a woman. Stop trying to act like the men in church. And we need to understand that in Christian worship and life, chosen androgyny or usurping God-assigned roles is ultimately a failure to glorify God. And that is the essence of sin. Paul uses this word glory right there in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, and he picks it up throughout this passage in 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7. We see him saying this, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. He says, when a man chooses to not act like a woman, he's being who God imaged him forth to be. But woman, you need to remember that there was a creation order and you were created to be the completion of man's significance and beauty. And the only way you glorify God is not by usurping his role, not by dominating his role, by replacing him in the church, but by being that Ezer Konegno, that helpmate that God has made you to be. Embrace your womanhood because that's how you glorify God. Okay. So what does that mean in 2020? 
How do we determine culturally appropriate expressions of our divinely ordained gender differences? Now, I want to tell you that in many churches, there is still a physical expression of this that would seem very familiar to the ancient Corinthians. If you go to many churches, you'll see women coming to church. To, uh, if they're going to be in public worship, they cover their heads with hats, or uh, in some groups, they put a lace doily on top of their head as an expression of this physical authority over them. And if that is within your conscience to do so, that is an area that I would say is certainly disputable and we would not lay that upon anybody. But we do need to ask the question of this, how do we do what Paul is urging the Corinthians to do essentially? How do we maintain worship that both reveals masculinity and femininity? How do we do it in a way within every culture that is an appropriate expression of God-ordained gender differences so that we can say to the world, when Jesus saves men and women, he saves them in the same way, but he doesn't strip away the gender he created them to have. How do we do that? Well, let me give you at least uh, uh, four or five principles here on that particular thing. Number one, choose to deliberately represent submission to biblically appropriate authority. Paul is concerned that the women are acting in a way that pagans are going to see them uncovered because a woman's head covering in worship was an expression of the authority of God and her husband and the church over her, and women were rejecting that authority and symbolizing it by not wearing a head covering. So Paul says, choose deliberately to represent the opposite. Say, yes, I am saved, and that saving grace allows me to not live in fear of someone else's authority, but it, chooses, it allows me to represent that authority in a physical way. And so he says, this is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. He says it needs to be visible a visible expression of authority in a woman's life needs to be present. You may think of it this way, just in the way that wedding rings represent a mutual submission of husband and wife to one another, we could say that a woman having her head covered in these ancient times was this visible symbol of authority. Now, Paul throws in a passage, I'm not, or say, a, a comment that I'm not even going to begin to try and unpack because I can tell you it's been argued for 2,000 years, but it does mean something like this. The angels are watching. Isn't that interesting? That even in this worship service right now, that it's not just me looking at you on the screen, but the angels are actually watching you? And it's so important to Paul that he says, women, visibly represent that you're under the authority of the living God and his mediated authority within the church. And that's, how do we do that? Well, we have to figure this out with some other tools that Paul points out. Uh, number two is what Paul calls nature in this passage, uh, what we would probably call cultural norms, not something built into nature like a law of gravity, but rather the order of things. So Paul says in verse 14, does not nature or the order of things itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, I want to tell you something. This is not an innate reality. Women that have short hair are not failing to glorify God. That's not, their, that's not true unless you, they're doing it deliberately to look like a man, then they might be rejecting God's authority. But it can be an expression of their femininity and like the Stoics who lived before Paul wrote this, some men in some cultural groups, the men might grow their hair long, even like Absalom in the Bible, they might grow their hair long as an expression of their masculinity. 
but he's saying in a society, we look around us and we see there are cultural norms and order of things about how men and women express their femininity and their masculinity. He says in the church, we don't step away from those things, acting as if the cross took us away from it. Instead, we recognize that those are part of how God has made us. So that becomes a second tool we use to discern how we are to express this authority. The third principle Paul gives is the inward conviction and guidance of the Spirit. He does it in this passage in verse 13 when he says, judge for yourselves. He makes the assumption that these are mature Christians and that they know by the guidance of the Holy Spirit what would be a culturally appropriate way to express the authority that women are under in the church. He says, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? And in that society where women would know normatively express their submission to God and their coming under his authority by covering their head, anybody with a conscience would recognize that if you weren't doing that, you were doing it as an act of rebellion and rejection. So he says, let the Holy Spirit convict you and guide you. And women, I would say to you as your pastor, it is not the place of men to tell you how to dress in a way that expresses the authority of Christ over you, but it is the place of the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you into recognizing what does it mean for you to reveal the goodness and glory of God in worship in an expression that is truly feminine. Fourth, he says, the faith community. The faith community as a whole helps us. And he starts the passage in verse 2 by talking about how the Corinthians are holding to traditions of worship. And he talks about that again in verse 16. And so he says, listen, if you want to know what the right thing to do here is, look at all the other churches. There's a way that we learn from one another, from the other bodies of Christ. And so in verse 2, you see him saying this, I commend you because you remember me in everything, and you maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. So you had a tradition of how you were to worship, and that tradition came not just because it was Paul's opinion, but because it's what the churches in other places did. If you went to Jerusalem, this is how the Jerusalem women were worshiping. If you went to Rome, this is how the Roman women were worshiping. He says, in fact, if anyone's inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice. And that's, that's not a great translation. It means, he says, there's no other way that I've ever seen this done in any other church. This is the way women in church, in the Christian church, act, and this is the way men in the Christian church act. And so none of the other churches have a different way of doing this. So there is a way in which we test all tradition and cultural practice within the church against the word of God, but we also recognize that we are intended by God to learn from our fellow believers. All right, so we have seen that there is an authoritative gospel. We've seen that this gospel doesn't strip away our gender, but it calls for full gender expression. And so we have a gendered gospel. And then finally, we want to see today briefly that we have a renewing gospel, a renewing gospel. Look in verses 11 and 12, and you see that Paul says, nevertheless, even though we're having this whole discussion about women's head coverings and the authority of men over women and in the church and so on, he says, in the Lord, in the Lord, and, and every theologian that I could find points out what a unique and powerful phrase, under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, woman is not independent of, or uh, in Greek it says without, not independent or without man, nor man of woman. In other words, ladies, you need the men in church. And men, you need the women. You need them to rise up and be all that God created them to be within their gender. And he shows how there's, he illustrates that there's an, an interdependence that's built into physical reality. As woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. He says, even the way that the life cycle works within uh, the, 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 the human race is telling us something about the way God wants things to be in the church. We need each other. 
And too often, ladies, I understand men have, have used passages like the one we're studying today to subjugate women, to not listen to them. They failed to steward their authority in a sacrificial, serving, and loving way, and I am sorry. I am profoundly sorry for that. And too often men have used this kind of authority to abscond from their responsibility rather than to rise up to their responsibility. And men, you need to hear me clearly. We need these women leaders and we need them to be full expressions of all that God intended women to be in this body. And I thank God that we have women in leadership across every area of our church life. And it's a joy-giving thing. And it is a joy-giving thing to raise up elders in the church, male elders in the church, to be ready to lead and to be all that God has called them to be as men. Because all things are from God. Can I just remind us of this? That our shared salvation is intended to tear down the hostility that Adam and Eve felt towards each other the moment that their sin was exposed. In the same way that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and said, listen, pagans, Greeks, Jews, barbarians, your shared salvation destroys the hostility between peoples and tribes, different religious backgrounds. I would say to you, Adam, Eve, your shared salvation destroys the mutual hostility. So we can rejoice in the same way that the Ephesians did in their church. We can say, sons of Adam, daughters of Eve, Jesus died to reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. There is no place for misogyny and misandry in the church. No place for a hatred of men, no place for snarky little comments about women are like this and men like that. No place for a despising of the other genders. No place for despising gender as a whole. The hostility between us has been killed at the cross. We're united by the same blood, and we've been granted a shared access to the same Father through the same indwelling Holy Spirit. Through him, we have access in one spirit to the Father. That means the Holy Spirit that indwells the women in our church and the Holy Spirit who indwells the men in our church is the same Holy Spirit. We do not have him less in quantity nor in quality, though we may have deferring relationships that are not dependent upon our gender, but upon our spiritual maturity and our discipleship. We need to recognize that we are being renewed into a united body, worshiping together as one family of God. Paul doesn't want to strip away the masculinity and femininity of women. He wants to unite them in worship. He wants them to stop thinking about the fact that they're not men and they're not women. And he wants to say to them, guess what? Together you worship God and you do it best by being all the man and all the woman that God has called you to be. So we are no longer strangers and aliens to each other, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone of each of our lives in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, our lives becoming worship within that gendered authority and reality. Brothers and sisters, we are being renewed into who God has created us to be. I want you to understand that when Jesus saved you, it wasn't to relieve you from being a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve. It was to free you to be all that being a son of Adam and a daughter of Eve meant. It was to let you be more of who you were created to be, to restore you to the garden before the fall so that you could glorify him forever in his ways. And that means we need to recognize this wonderful good news, that Jesus is taking all the broken expressions of our femininity and our masculinity, 
and he is making them new. He's making them new. He's resetting them, redeeming them, and rebooting them. I want to close with this quote from a wonderful scholar named Ben Witherington, who's commenting on this passage. I found just really, really, really profound. Ben says this, worship is the act of praising and glorifying God for who God is. Now stop there for just a second. See, the Corinthians had made a mistake and they had tried to make worship about their gender. They needed to be rebooted or be reminded that worship is the act of praising and glorifying God for who God is, which at the same time entails that human beings recognize who they are, men and women, as beings under God and in Christ. In other words, if you come to Jesus trying to deny who he has made you to be, you're rejecting your creator in the fullness of your identity. And Ben goes on to say the proper human response to redemption is that both women and men not only bear witness to who they are, but to whose they are. Who do they belong to? Now, we need God's grace to help us do that this week and in all the weeks that follow. So let's pray and ask him to do that. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you did not abandon us to our own wills when you saved us. You placed earthly authorities around us in family life, parents, teachers. You raised us up to have authority in our employment and within government, and you gave us homes in which we express that authority in different ways. And then you brought us into the church where we have authorities placed over us, and we see that authority as a good thing. Forgive us for too often rejecting that. And God, we admit that too often we want to, to lay down the burdens and responsibilities of our, per, our gender that you have created us with. We've rejected it because it seems complicated and difficult and broken, and, and the world seems confusing and challenging, and, it's, and we don't want to rise up to being who you have called and created us to be. But we ask for grace and forgiveness healing and restoration. Our church, even at this size, Lord, is too small, too big to not have people who are struggling with this very reality, whether it's in the realm of authority or sexuality or in roles within the household. But we're asking God for grace that enables us to recognize that each and every day as we seek to live by that grace in such a way that you are glorified, that we are becoming more and more who we were actually created to be. And we're asking for your Holy Spirit to empower us and to grant us discernment and wisdom on how to apply these principles in contemporary ways that the world may see and know you. And of course, we can only ask this in the name of and through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth Sweet righteousness for me Stands in my defense Jesus is your blood and Your blood speaks a better word Than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth Sweet righteousness for me stands in my defense. Jesus is your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood. Can't wash us.
1, 24 and 25, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we look to your great glory today. Your glory is our great joy. To our Lord Jesus Christ goes all of the majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Father, we look to your Son to present us blameless before your presence. We ask now that as the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God, that you would keep us from stumbling. As we have heard the message of Christ risen today, so I hope we rise with him, a new creation. I ask that you would give us hearts of submission to your divine authority, and that it would be our greatest joy. In your name, I ask these things. Amen. Uh, just a couple quick reminders again tonight. Our uh, um, women's and men's groups are separate. Um, also, you can still give to the, uh, and I would encourage you guys to give to the Hunger Fund. Um, I'd like you guys to uh, spend some time uh, in uh, uh, Fellowship. fellowshipping, with, uh, thank you, fellowshipping with one another um, for a few order. minutes um, before we go. Also, if you have not given your Chipotle order to Chris uh, for the men's group, please do so. Thank you. <laughs> 